First of all, two duties to discharge. One is that, as always on these occasions, I am happy and privileged to bring you greetings from the inmates of Canterbury Prison, who wanted me to send their Christmas greetings to the Cathedral Congregation after their service this morning. And the second is to thank you for the prayers that you have offered in recent years for our Anglican brothers and sisters in Zimbabwe in their time of great trial, being locked out of the cathedral in Harare. And I'm delighted to tell you that 10 days ago, they celebrated the reoccupation of the cathedral in Harare and the Supreme Court's judgment in favor of the church. I think a straw in the wind for a future of justice and stability in Zimbabwe. I hope you'll keep all of them in your prayers, and I know how deeply grateful the Anglicans of Zimbabwe are for the support they've received from this congregation and many others. Well, 59% of British people describe themselves as Christians, so the census informed us a couple of weeks ago. 12% down from 10 years back. There was, of course, great delight from a couple of secularist organizations. But if I were a member of the British Humanist Association, I might want to pause before I became too excited. It remains true that three quarters of the public still want to identify themselves as having a religious faith of some kind. And what the census doesn't and probably can't measure is exactly how those who don't identify as religious think about religion. Do they never give it a thought? Do they wish they could believe something? Do they see it as a problem or as a resource in society? In the deeply painful aftermath of the Synod's vote last month, what was startling was how many people who certainly wouldn't have said yes to the census question, turned out to have a sort of investment in the church, a desire to see the church looking credible, and a real sense of loss when, as they saw it, the church failed to sort its business out. There's a lot more questions to ask before we could possibly assume that the census figures told us that faith was losing its hold on society. But, and here's the challenging thing, what if those figures had been worse? What if they get worse in the next few years? Should we conclude that faith in general, and Christian faith in particular, had had its day, and that we should give up on it? The answer has to be a resounding no. We might feel that we'd made a poor job of communicating it. We might regret the enormous loss to public life and public service involved in the weakening of faith. But we simply could not conclude that faith had suddenly become impossible or incredible. Faith is not about what public opinion decides, and it's not about how we happen to be feeling about ourselves. It's the response people make to what presents itself as a reality, a reality that makes claims on you. Here is something so extraordinary that it interrupts our world. Here is something that, like Moses in the story of the burning bush, makes you turn aside to see, something that stops you short. Faith begins in the moment of stopping, you could say. The moment when you can't just walk on as you did before. But even more challengingly, it's something whose claims involve change and even loss. If this is really what it seems to be, ideas, hopes, habits all change. And it's a change that's going to be painful. T.S. Eliot, in the most haunting Christmas poem in the English language, imagines the wise men 
back at home after their journey to Bethlehem, no longer at ease here in the old dispensation, and wondering whether what they had seen was birth or death. I had seen birth and death, but had thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. Yet the wise men can't deny that they've seen what they've seen. They really made the journey, and they really saw something that persuaded them it had been worthwhile. Faith, a claim, a shock, a death, a life. It was, you may say, satisfactory, says Eliot's wise man in a masterpiece of Eliot understatement. The wise men had found what they were looking for, and it was not at all what they thought they had been looking for. The Christian gospel declares two equally necessary truths. Jesus is the hope of the nations. Jesus is what the entire human race really longs to see the person whose presence heals all wounds and griefs. And Jesus is an utter surprise, so foreign that he is unrecognizable to those who might have been expected to welcome him. To borrow a phrase from a recent film, he's not the savior we deserve, he's the savior we need. He's certainly not the savior we have ordered from a mail-order religious company. He made the world, says St. John, and he spoke in its history, but the world had no room for him, and the experts in revelation and religious purity turned from him in disgust. You should never open the New Testament without remembering that the religious experts and the temple hierarchy are the ones who see Jesus as their enemy. They don't want to be interrupted, to stop and see. The truth of God is the most comforting and joyful presence we can imagine, and also the most disorienting and demanding. There's a famous Old Testament story about the great military leader of Israel's fiercest enemy, who comes to the prophet Elisha to be healed of his leprosy. And the prophet tells him simply to wash in the river. He is indignant. Surely there must be something more difficult and glamorous and heroic to do. No, it's perfectly simple. Go and wash. Go and join all those ordinary humble folk who are sluicing themselves in the river after a long day's work or beating their laundry against the stones. Go and join the rest of the human race and acknowledge who you are. That's the truest heroism and the hardest. It's a foreshadowing of the New Testament invitation. Repent and believe and be baptized. Turn round and look where you've never looked before. Trust the one who is calling you and drop under the water of his overflowing compassion. Be with him. Join the new human race, recreated in the spirit of mutual love and delight and service. If Jesus is strange and threatening, isn't that, the New Testament suggests, a sign of how far we've wandered from real humanity? real honesty about our weaknesses and limits. I am the great sun, but you do not see me. The beginning of another wonderful poem by Charles Causley. We're so fascinated by our own business, whether we call it religious or not, that we find it hard and bitter agony to turn away and be still and look at the mystery of love. If we think about religion, perhaps we think of it as a set of neat answers to our questions, or as a system of behavior, ritual and moral, or as an optional extra to ordinary life 
for those who find certain sorts of problems interesting. But Jesus does not come just to answer the questions we think important. One of the great features of all the Gospels, especially St. John's Gospel, is how often Jesus refuses to answer the question put to him and asks a question in reply. And Jesus does not come to give us a set of techniques for keeping God happy. And he certainly doesn't come to create a harmlessly eccentric hobby for speculative minds. He comes to make humanity itself new, to create fresh possibilities for being at peace with God and each other. And he does this by summoning us to be with him. And it shouldn't surprise us if all this doesn't instantly win the popular vote. If people hesitate to call themselves Christian, perhaps that's a sort of backhanded recognition that there is a strangeness and a toughness to what Christian faith claims that shouldn't be taken lightly. And yet, if many people still do, in spite of everything, want to call themselves by this name, that also means there's a recognition that somehow this is where we should be, where it's natural to be, in the company of this man, listening to his words, turning aside to see the mysterious events of his life and death and resurrection. But the one thing we can be sure of is that the truth or falsehood of faith doesn't rest on the success of the faith in winning numbers. Sometimes this seems to work and sometimes it doesn't. We can and we should try, as hard and imaginatively as we can, to share the faith. But we mustn't lose heart if it doesn't immediately take root as we might want. We are, after all, doing something rather outrageous, asking men and women to stop and look and turn around and learn how to keep company with a figure whose outlines we often see only dimly. Yet, when a life is lived that shows what that company really means, the outline becomes less dim, and people will begin to recognise why lives like that seem, despite everything, to be normal, the natural response to the way things are. When people respond to outrageous cruelty and violence with a hard-won readiness to understand and to be reconciled, few, if any, can bring themselves to say that all this is an illusion. The parents who have lost a child to gang violence, the wife who has seen her husband killed in front of her by an anti-Christian mob in India, the woman who has struggled for years to comprehend and accept the rape and murder of her sister. The Israeli and Palestinian friends who have been brought together by the fact that they have lost family members in the conflict and injustice that still racks the Holy Land. All these are specific people I have had the privilege of meeting as Archbishop over these ten years. And in their willingness to explore the new humanity of forgiveness and rebuilding relations without for a moment making light of their own or other people's nightmare suffering or trying to explain it away, these are the ones who make us see, who oblige us to turn aside and look, as if at a bush burning but not consumed, and to look at Jesus who asks of us initially just to stop and reflect, to stay for a moment in the light that allows us to see ourselves honestly and to see the world differently. And there's the heart of it. Seeing ourselves honestly, seeing the world differently. That's where faith begins. Beyond the answers of a system, 
or the disciplines of a ritual, or the requirements of a moral code. These have their place, and those who spend time in the company of Jesus will find themselves working out all these things in the light of the biblical witness to the new life. But it all starts with turning aside to see. And for some, for many perhaps, it's too much to take in and many will want to turn away. St. John describes just this in a later chapter of his Gospel, where Jesus' hearers say that his words are just too much for them, too offensive, too exacting, too weird. Yet if, if we can let go of our conviction that our questions, our priorities and worries and achievements and failures are the most important thing in the universe, if we can find the freedom to stop and turn aside, the world itself begins to turn into renewal. O come, let us adore him, says the carol. That adoration, that wondering gaze at the child in the manger is where faith is born. And where faith is born, so is the new world of Jesus and his Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.